What's up guys, UFC 257 just wrapped up and pretty good card, but I would say the last two fights carried most of it. There are good performances throughout, but we'll start with that main event. Dustin Poirier knocks out Conor McGregor in 2 minutes and 32 seconds of that second round. Talk about sticking to a game plan. He really showed his intelligence, even more of his technical side, and the most impressive thing from Dustin Poirier was the fact that he was able to stick to the game plan after getting tagged and rocked in the fight. He took a big left straight and then a right lead uppercut and still did not deter from the game plan. He still stuck to the leg kicks, attacked that calf throughout the fight, and just destroyed Conor's balance. The damage didn't let Connor even take the right stance that he wanted, did not allow him to move the way he wanted, and ultimately didn't allow him to punch the way he wanted, which all together made him a lot easier to hit, a lot easier to counter, and a lot easier to time everything he was doing. And we saw the outcome of it, and it's crazy to think about in the last seven years, even before that, Dustin Poirier is the only guy to focus on leg kicking Conor McGregor. I already know everybody who has witnessed Conor's fights ever since he started, everybody knew he would have a leg kicking weakness. It's the way his stance is. It's just so susceptible to leg kicks. It's so wide and especially countering him with leg kicks throws off those long range punches. He has to step in long before he throws a punch. If you can attack the leg when he steps in long, you will throw off that big punch. And it has a lot to do with Conor's stance these days as well. He's not so fluid and elusive like he used to be at 145. Ever since he came up to 155, and especially after coming back from boxing, he has really taken this like textbook style almost. Very front leg heavy, not bouncing around, not using a lot of movement, and just try to heavy pressure his opponent's back into countering them and all that stuff. He did it against Eddie Alvarez, he did it against Nate Diaz, he did it against Donald Cerrone, he did it against Habib. Here is show against the support, you cannot really stick to that too much. He didn't do it against Dustin Poirier in their first fight. He only started to do it after he tagged Poirier with the left hand and rocked him. Then he started to really stick heavy in front of him and look for the big shot. But before that, he was moving all around the place and he was doing a lot of kicks. That's another thing we don't see from Conor McGregor these days. Don't see a lot of kicks. Yeah, he threw the big high kick at uh, Donald Cerrone. He threw a spinning hook kick at Dustin Poirier, but it's not as active as it used to be. Remember when he fought Dennis Seaver or even Chad Mendez and all those guys back in the day? He was very active with all forms of striking. These days, he's not at all. He's so much of a boxer now. He's had a lot of success with it, so it's not to fault him, but... Looking at this fight and what he can change in a rematch, that's what ultimately you probably have to see. Don't stick so heavy on the front leg because Dustin's going to attack those legs again. If the rematch in fact does happen that Dana wants to do, Connor wants to do, and Dustin Poirier even talked about. I mean, I never thought I would say this, but Connor needs to bring back the touch butt guy. He needs to bring that guy back and get his movement back to how it was. Because this is not boxing. You stick heavy on your front leg like that, it's only going to get chopped or it's only going to get grabbed for takedowns. And it's crazy to think about that Conor fought Jose Aldo, who's pound for pound, one of the hardest leg kickers of the sport. And he did not throw any leg kicks at Conor McGregor. That is all thanks to Conor's mental warfare though. What he did to Jose Aldo's mental state was beyond savage. And frankly, he did kind of the same thing as Dustin Poirier for the limited amount of time he had with Poirier in the press conferences and all that stuff. I would probably think in hindsight, being best friends with Poirier is not the best thing to do, right? You want to attack his emotions. You want to get the worst version of Poirier out there because frankly, the best version of Dustin Poirier is better than the best version of Conor McGregor. We've seen that tonight. I know Conor's talking about ring rust and he's been inactive and that's why he wanted to stay active for so long and he didn't feel comfortable in there, whatever he was saying. It didn't really look like that to be honest. It's the whole fighter ego thing. Every fighter has an ego and if you hurt that ego, they look to blame other things rather than themselves you know they want to blame the fact that you know he wasn't able to be active instead of objectively looking at that he got called by leg kicks and he did not expect it he got taken down and he did not expect it Dustin Poirier went under that left straight and got him to the ground there are things Dustin Poirier did in that fight that Connor just did not see coming and he did not adjust to him that well so Dustin Poirier just had an amazing performance man I don't know what, exactly what he wants to do I know he's talking about the third fight and frankly that would do great financially for himself and the fact if he can get the third win in over Conor McGregor, it will do great for his mental state and he will just hit another level. But he warrants a title shot, so what does he really want here? Because Habib does not seem like he's coming back. I would absolutely love to see the rematch, but I also would love to see him fight Charles Oliveira for the title, because that's the fight that would have to happen. Dustin vs Charles is the rightful fight for the vacant title. If he skips over it, someone's going to take that title fight spot. I mean, it might be Michael Chandler, it might be Justin Gaethje fight Charles Oliveira. I don't know who it would be. Probably Chandler for the fact that he's coming off a win, and Justin Gaethje's coming off a loss in a title fight. 
but we do know about the rumors that Charles Oliveira is supposed to fight Justin Gaethje. So this is tough for Dustin Poirier. Does he pick the financial aspect of it? And then if he wins, then he gets a title shot or risk his title shot for the financial gain and possibly lose it all. Conor McGregor will step up and fight whoever's the champion at that time. I know what the organization would want to do. They would want the rematch so Conor can get his revenge, take out Dustin Poirier and get right into a title fight. His star power is back. I wonder how much of a hit this was on Conor McGregor's star power. I don't think much to be honest, but the fact that he got knocked out like that on a grand stage that is allegedly trending to be like 2 million pay-per-view buys or whatever it is, top two of all time, that is not a good look, man. I mean, the biggest pay-per-view of all time, he got choked out and dominated. Second biggest pay-per-view of all time, he got knocked out by Dustin Poirier. So we definitely know what the organization wants to do, but it all comes down to what does Dustin Poirier want to do? Because frankly, the world is at his feet. He does what he wants and like his motto goes, he gets paid in full, and he gets 25 minutes to make life fair and he did both those things man he has so many opportunities at this moment crazy to think that this guy is at the position he is in now the guy from 145 that was essentially like the gatekeeper couldn't win the big fights is now one of the top fighters in the ufc one of the biggest stars after this fight in the ufc making a bunch of money and doing great things with his foundation dustin Poirier is a one of a kind just an all-around good guy man and now let's say dustin Poirier does go up to fight for the title and leaves connor out what happens to connor mcgregor who does he fight i kind of agree with errol hawani it would have to be the nate diaz trilogy but would Nate Diaz do it? Would Nate Diaz fight Connor off a loss? You know how much he doesn't like fighting guys off losses. And he's already talked about it before that he doesn't need to fight Conor McGregor. In his mind, he beat him twice already. So I don't know if that's even going to happen. I don't even know if Nate Diaz would actually do that. But that would probably be the biggest and most logical fight for Conor coming off this loss. If not that, they could do him versus Justin Gaethje. That'd be interesting. Or they could do him versus Michael Chandler. They could do him versus Dan Hooker. There's a lot of options for Conor who wants to be very active in 2021. And to be honest, after seeing what Dustin Poirier did to Conor, I do not like Conor's chances against Justin Gaethje. If that was Justin Gaethje attacking those legs, Conor would not have been able to stand up in the second round. And we're talking about a patient Justin Gaethje was much, much harder to hit. Justin Gaethje absolutely can do exactly what Dustin Poirier did, but with more power and better elusive movement. And talking about Michael Chandler, man, that co event, he knocked out Dan Hooker in the very first round. Now, even though I was wrong on this prediction, I was also wrong on the main event with my official prediction. The methods of what I was talking about of what these fighters would have to do to win kind of happened, right? Dustin Poirier would have to go to a lot of light kicks and mix up the wrestling with his striking, specifically the shift combination, into the takedown under a punch from Conor McGregor. This is the stuff that would have to happen for Dustin Poirier to win. All strictly game plan stuff, right? As for Michael Chandler, it all came down to could Dan Hooker take a big punch? Could he take one big shot from Michael Chandler? If he could not, he would lose because it would happen. He will get hit 100%. Dan Hooker just doesn't have solid defense. His defense is pretty much his offense. And that is not the best thing going against someone like Michael Chandler, who had a bit, not questionable power. We all knew he's one of the most powerful guys in the world, but questionable in the sense of where does he rank in like the top three punchers? Does he hit harder than Gaethje? That was the big question to come into this fight. If he hits harder than Gaethje or anywhere compared to Gaethje, really, Dan Hooker was going to be in a lot of trouble. But the fact that he dropped Dan Hooker with one single punch, knowing the kind of trauma that Dan Hooker had to withstand throughout his career, man, I might just say confidently that Michael Chan is the most powerful guy in 155. He's right ahead of Justin Gaethje, I think. So right now, I would probably say Michael Chandler is number one, hardest puncher. Justin Gaethje is number two. Number three gets iffy, right? It could be Conor McGregor, but he's not far off from anybody else. Even Dustin Poirier hits pretty hard. Yeah, Chandler and Gaethje, I believe, hit harder than everybody else by a considerable margin. And not only Chandler's power is something to take note, but the fact that he was able to condition Dan Hooker the way he did is like John Jones level stuff. First, he was gauging how Dan Hooker was moving in the fight and whether he would engage him with any kind of offense. When he saw that all Dan Hooker was doing was moving to his right and throwing leg kicks, trying to avoid a right hand, he knew Dan Hooker was in a defensive state. So Hooker pretty much gave Chandler all the room and all the time to start setting up on him. He kept winging those big right hands to the body. And whenever he threw it, Hooker's hands dropped lower and lower every time that right hand came at him. Ultimately setting up a left hook follow up that intercepts the movement, that right directional movement from Dan Hooker in an instant. It was so fast and so powerful. He shot it like a rocket and just dropped Dan Hooker with one single punch came down with another one that essentially looked like it put out Dan Hooker for a little bit. It was a clear cut, very simple performance for Michael Chandler. It wasn't even that hard of a fight for him. He just took a few leg kicks that started to do a lot of damage, but ultimately nothing too hard for him. That's crazy to think about. 
who would think not only would Michael Chandler win a fight in the UFC, he would fight one of the top contenders, a guy who went to war with Dustin Poirier and put him in a lot of problems, and had very few issues with the guy. It made the fight look pretty easy, and I know Dan Hooker was pretty upset with his performance. He, I think he threw his mouthpiece in the cage when he left and stuff, like he was very upset at himself. The fact that he couldn't take that one big shot, it was inevitable he was going to lose this fight. Unless he was able to land a quick one before Chandler, which is a bit questionable given Chandler's speed and how explosive he is, how athletic he is. He would be the first one on the trigger. In hindsight, it did not look like a good fight for Dan Hooker. And who should these two fight next? I personally want to see Michael Chandler versus Justin Gaethje. I think it's the fight that needs to happen. That would be a war. That would be such an explosive fight between the two hardest strikers in this division. That would be crazy. And we know Chandler will try to take down Gaethje at some moment of the fight. So we'll see some wild wrestling scrambles all over the place. That's the fight I would love to see next. And as for Dan Hooker, that's a second loss in a row. And he's number six. So he's going to drop down a little bit. I think him versus Tony Ferguson makes a lot of sense. Both coming off two losses, fan-friendly styles, and they'll put on a very exciting fight. Both long guys, a lot of volume, good cardio, tough as nails. That's probably the fight I look at. And shout out to Muradov and Marina Rodriguez with some slick counter right hands essentially finishing off their opponents. The Rodriguez finish was a little bit weird. The ref later played out a little bit too long and it looked like he was going to jump in, but then he didn't. Herb Dean had a little bit of a mess up there, I think. But it happens sometimes. And that was the biggest underdog win of the entire night. So a solid night of fights, guys. And it's pretty late right now. It's like 5.30 in the morning. Extremely tired. But Chandler's and Poirier's performances got me so happy, so excited, so amped up. I feel like I had another surge of energy when the fights were going on. And I'll see you guys in the next video, which will most likely be the podcast.